Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Mutual UFO Network Los Angeles. My name is Jolene Ray Harrington, and I'm the Director of Public Relations. Let me ask you a question. Who's minding our heritage? Now, that's a question that perhaps never occurred to us before the tragic looting of the Iraqi Museum. That uh, looting sacrificed a astonishing collection of, of ancient artifacts from one of the world's oldest cultures. These priceless relics contain clues to the truth of humanity's past, and they may be lost to us now, possibly forever. Indeed, many of the world's museums are beyond the scope of the average American. But tonight's speaker, Jason Martell, has dedicated himself to meticulously documenting many of these important artifacts, posting them on his website, xfacts.com, so that everyone can see them for themselves. This is just one way our heritage can become known to us. And for those who are familiar with the work of Zechariah Sitchin and Ancient Sumer, this is an exciting opportunity to conduct a virtual examination of some of the evidence. And this availability to us is absolutely unprecedented. Who's minding our science? As many of us are aware, a courageous few are challenging traditional scientific theses and questioning the evidence from outside the inner circle. Jason Martell is one of these researchers. He probes from answers from those who are in the know and strives to make evidence available to all of us, even evidence that the establishment wants buried on the back page. Thanks to researchers like Jason, the need to know is no longer the exclusive prerogative of the academic or intelligentsia elite. It is now a universal right, and we at MUFON will continue to support those in the vanguard and let them know we appreciate their efforts. I appreciate you, Jason. And thanks for jumping in here at the last minute and being a real sport about it. MUFON LA, let's tell Jason how much we appreciate his work. Thank you. The data that I'll be showing tonight is uh, the most current that we have for the topic of a Planet X, and then also divulging into the research and information as bequeathed by Zachariah Sitchin and showing some artifacts that, uh, that I've been able to acquire and, and the story that comes along with them as we go. Tonight, basically, what I'm going to do is, again, just share information relating to a Planet X. Uh, I am taking somewhat of, of a broad stroke in that... Uh, some of the information I'm going to be discussing tonight, it does help to have somewhat of a foundation of understanding of topics such as Nibiru, Planet X, or the work of Zachariah Sitchin. So I'd strongly recommend, um, which I'll talk about in the end, that you visit the website xfacts.com or use the resources that I'm going to cite to learn about this information on your own. I can only highlight uh, as much of the finer points as possible, but there is obviously a lot of data to go through. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Curtis, next slide, please. So again, uh, what we're going to be looking at is some of the current research for the topic of a Planet X. Uh, there has been a lot of research done through mainstream science in uh, detecting a planet or another large body beyond Pluto and many theories abroad as to what effects or signs we might have to prove that a Planet X does exist. Next slide, please. So uh, anyone who's familiar with the story or the saga, I should now say, of the Planet X information, uh, was aware of the fact that in the early 80s, um, some of the most esoteric research actually started to come out on this topic. And we, through the advances of modern science, were using a telescope at the time. One of them was the infrared astronomical satellite. And uh, it went out there and took pictures. And um, basically what happens is we have a whole system of satellites in orbit now, which I'll get into. But this one at the time uh, was another super-cooled uh, telescope detecting uh, ranges of infrared light from very, very um, distant and dark objects. For instance, we have things that are called brown dwarfs that are basically like our sun, but it's a failed sun, so it's a very dark, and at some point some of these turn into a very cold mass and are just floating around out in space and are very hard to detect. So they invented telescopes that are super cooled sitting out in space that can detect below freezing temperatures and actually penetrate dust clouds and see objects that you wouldn't actually be able to see uh, without any visible light. Next slide, please. Some of you also might be familiar with seeing this diagram on the internet. I also have yet to confirm the authenticity, uh, but this is from the Encyclopedia Britannica uh, edition of New Science and Technology. Um, and this diagram is specifically talking about the Pioneer 10 probe. Uh, and if you'll notice, I'm not sure if there's a date listed on here. Yes, here what you see at the bottom. 
But right around in the early 80s, this information started to come out and be, become public knowledge. And at that time, the Encyclopedia Britannica documenting this did make some very interesting uh, no notations if, in fact, this is an authentic diagram. You'll notice that, uh, you know, and I should have asked if anyone in the audience has a laser pointer. I didn't bring mine tonight. Yeah. Oh, look at that. They do have one. I don't want to keep walking over here and losing camera focus. But as he's, as he's bringing that over, so you'll notice that if you look closely, you'll see that there's the Earth, and uh, you'll see the, the trajectory of the two probes. But interestingly enough, aside from sighting our sun, you'll see that there's at the way very top there, there's a dead star 10 billion miles out. Or does it say 50 million? 50 billion. 50 billion. They're sighting a dead star, which very interestingly enough, you know, this has just been coming out in the last decade that solar systems could actually be binary, that most solar systems imaged by Hubble have two stars. So this was pretty interesting to find, let alone be able to authenticate its, uh, its information. But as we go on to the next slide, Curtis, um, the reason why this was being uh, probably extolled in the encyclopedia at that time is there was actual research going on in the early 80s all the way up until the early 90s. Uh, one of the lead astronomers that's famous for doing Planet X, Planet X research is Dr. Harrington, shown here on the bottom left. In the early uh, 80s, Dr. Harrington was the lead astronomer for the National, excuse me, the Naval Observatory held in uh, Washington, basically NASA's headquarters. And he was one of the lead astronomers at the time uh, doing data based on the perturbations of the outer planets that he, he theorized that there should be another planet out there. Meaning, when we uh, started doing mathematical calculations on the outer planets like Uranus and Neptune, they noticed that there was a slight pull being exerted on the planets to suggest that there's some large object out there influencing the planets. That was the, the theory at the time. Now, the, the idea that this extrasolar planet, you know, or a tenth planet, a body out there is um, causing perturbations on the outer planets and that's how we would look for it. That's not actually the latest research that they're using to look for a planet X. It's actually more infrared based and using, uh, using telescopes. So at the time, this was the latest model for understanding a planet X. It's a little outdated now and it's, it's not quite accepted uh, by mainstream science. But interestingly enough, uh, many of the things that we talk about aren't accepted by mainstream science. And, and in fact, all the models that mainstream science are prognosticating don't, in, don't include uh, all the information that we're still trying to figure out how Earth's formation came about and this idea of, of another planet. Thank you so much. Appreciate okay. it. Let's see. Does this guy work? It's a little spotty. All right. There we go. Next slide, please. So what we're looking at here is uh, Dr. Harrington in the early 80s, unfortunately he is now deceased, he died in a car accident. Um, some people like to have speculated that there was some, you know, undercover covert reason why he was killed and that he was coming back from a telescope. And I, I don't personally subscribe to the theory that Dr. Harrington was involved in a conspiracy and was killed because of Planet X information, but, you know, I, I really can't uh, ascertain all the facts around his death to say that. There are obviously some anomalous parts to the story and NASA has not been very forthcoming with the information as far as a Planet X or Dr. Harrington's research. So it does raise a lot of eyebrows. What we're looking at here are basically uh, astronomical plates of all the stars taken at the time in the region where Dr. Harrington thought a Planet X would be located. So what they would do is they would take these images of, the, of, of star fields and designate every single object in there as a known source and then filter out the possibilities for what objects could possibly be co 